Howdy folks, welcome back to another CS128 Honors lesson. Today, we're going to be finishing our discussion on parallelism and concurrency and beginning our discussion on the final project. So this will be the last of the sort of uh, Tuesday, Thursday, twice a week lectures. Uh, we still will sell, we will still have some lessons afterwards and we'll discuss the, the structure, the logistics of those in just a bit. But uh, first, I want to just finish off our discussion on parallelism concurrency with some discussion on shared state. Now, you know, we already really discussed shared state in the very first lecture of these when we talked about, you know, live locks and deadlocks and uh, starvation and, you know, all this other stuff. But, okay, putting some uh, concrete examples to it uh, can be helpful. Quick reminders, homework nine is due tomorrow at midnight. Okay, so without further ado, we'll go ahead and get started. So um, really the fundamental sort of, okay, there's a couple sort of fundamental objects uh, when it comes to shared state um, communication. Uh, the big idea that I want to sort of first introduce is, is the differentiation between messaging and shared state. So in messaging, you know, we have uh, some thread which is operating here and some other thread which is maybe operating here. Okay, so this is thread one, this is thread two. In shared state, what we're doing is we're allocating a little piece of memory here that we want to be shared across threads. And both threads can interact with this sort of, okay, I don't want to say as they please because that can cause issues, but we will put some limits on how they can interact with it. But the idea is that it's still the same location and they're both interacting with it. Now, let's contrast this a little bit with messaging. In messaging, you have, you know, a channel. And so you have a thread that is sending messages and some thread that is receiving messages. And maybe many threads are sending messages, but still, you know, you have, or maybe even many threads are receiving messages. Um, you know, fundamentally, this is still some aspect of shared memory because this is like some region of memory that is shared that we have to control the usage of. But in terms of how we're formulating these problems, uh, I think that messaging can can be a little bit easier sometimes, uh, maybe less dangerous. Now, that being said, uh, it's also generally, you know, less fundamental. Um, you know, you can easily build messaging with just mutexes and, and whatnot, uh, but mutexes are a very fundamental idea. So, okay, what is a mutex? Mutex stands for mutual exclusion. And what it means is that we're allowing exactly one thread to access a piece of data at any given time. Now, there's only two rules to mutexes, but they're very important to remember. First, before we access the data, we must, what we say, acquire the mutexes lock. And before we, or once we are done with the data, we must relinquish that lock. Okay, there's like a million analogies that can go with mutexes. The one that the Rust textbook uses is, say you have a, a panel of people. Okay, so I'll draw some people here. Uh, and it's like a discussion, right? And they're all talking about things maybe to some crowd. But unfortunately, we have only one microphone. Okay, um, before you speak into the microphone, you must acquire the microphone. And once you are finished with the microphone, you must relinquish the microphone to someone else if they have something to say, right? Okay, that's, that's uh, I think, an easy analogy. Um, really, conceptually, mutexes are, are relatively simple. We have some region of memory, and before uh, some thread can access it, it needs to see if it is locked or unlocked right? And so, okay, maybe this one's locked, and so this thread will wait. Um, and maybe it'll keep pulling, maybe it'll go do something else and come back later, who knows, right? Okay, uh, and so let's just look at some basic examples on, on how to actually implement these. Uh, I'll go through these a little bit fast, they're not too complex, uh, and we've seen this. So, okay, mutexes are in the sync uh, crate. We can create a mutex just like this, it doesn't have to be an int, we can put, you know, pretty much anything in there. Um, but okay, well, for now, we'll just say it's an int and we want to count to 10 using 10 different threads, right? Okay, so this example, uh, just to spoil things, does not work. So take a moment and read this and see if you can figure out why it would not work. Okay, so let's start to analyze this together. Uh, so we're creating this mutex, so there's this region in memory, uh, and currently it is unlocked. Okay, um, my lock's not the best drawing, but it works. And okay, we have some vector that we want to store the handles in. We will spawn 10 threads. Uh, each thread we will store the handle in the vector, nothing crazy going on there. 
and then each thread will lock the mutex and then increment the number. And then, okay, once it goes out of scope, it should unlock. Okay, uh, okay, there's there's clearly some issues here. Most notably, um, you know, we have this move keyword, we have counter here. Once the thir first thread is spawned, uh, the first thread will have ownership over this mutex. And so the second thread can't also have ownership. Right, okay, so that, that's the issue with this one, is uh, we're, we're trying to access something that we've already moved, we don't have ownership over it anymore. So what we can do if we want to implement this thing called multiple ownership is use these reference counters. Now, reference counters are smart pointers, just like boxes. There's really just one fundamental difference, which is, okay, we have some region of memory that we would like to uh, wrap our reference counter around. We'll just say this is our mutex. Uh, we can have multiple things, you know, own this now. And the way we do this is we clone the reference counter. <clears throat> Excuse me. And the reference counter is going to keep track of how many things are sort of uh, accessing it at a time, right? And then, okay, eventually, you know, this thread no longer needs access to it. And so this number is decremented back to two. This no longer needs access to it. So it's back to one. This no longer needs access to it. Now it knows no one's accessing it and it can destroy itself, right? Because it knows that it, uh, uh, it's, it's counting the references at the end of the day. Okay, so this is an example of multiple ownership in Rust uh, in a way. Obviously, you know, fundamentally, when we start to actually try to edit these things, we still might have to be careful. Um, but this is sort of a, a functionality of that. An analogy that we can give real quick, once again, from the Rust textbook, is imagine you have a television and you are a part of a family. Um, okay, you know, when you come into the uh, living room to watch the TV, not my best couch, huh? Let me see if I can make this like a little comfier. It's actually not too bad. Okay, you know, you, you come into the uh, living room and you start watching some TV and the TV, okay, you turn on the TV and the one person is watching the TV, right? And then your brother comes in, uh, now two people are watching the TV and then, okay, your sister comes in and three people are watching the TV. Now, okay, you can leave, uh, but there's still two other people watching the TV. So you don't wanna, you know, okay, the analogy here is you don't wanna drop the TV, you don't wanna drop that region of memory. Um, because two other people are watching it, right? And then, okay, your your sister leaves next, and now it's back to one. And then eventually your brother leaves, and it uh, he can turn off the TV when he leaves, because he knows that no one else is there. Just like when you drop that last counter, when the last reference for the reference counter is dropped, then uh, things are good. Okay, there is this uh, edge case, though, right? So let's say uh, we have our reference counter of a mutex here, okay? And we clone it. And so uh, to clone it, okay, so somewhere in the reference counter, we have like some int that represents how many things are looking at it. We'll just say four. And so this thread here is going to say, okay, let x equal, uh, you know, some piece of data. We'll, we'll call this um, count. Okay, and then it wants to say essentially count equals x plus 1. Okay, but let's say it does this and it gets x equals count and then right here an interrupt occurs because some other thread over here, which is already looking at count, finishes what it's doing. Okay, uh, so this thread finishes and it's going to say let x equal count and it's going to rewrite count to be 3. Okay, so this will be 3. Okay, and then this thread will resume. Uh, and now what we're saying is, okay, we already read x, we already read count. And so this is four, and now we're about to make it five. So we think five things are looking at this uh, mutex, but really only four things are looking at this mutex, right? And okay, this is an example of a, a sort of memory leak, right? This can happen the other way too, uh, you know, closing it too soon, and now we're staring at uninitialized memory, which, okay, maybe arguably is even worse. But the idea is, okay, because this uh, incrementing and decrementing of the reference isn't uh, thread safe, we can't necessarily use it. Okay, luckily there is a, an easy fix for this. All we have to do is replace a reference counter, which is not thread safe, with a atomic reference counter. All The only thing that the atomic stands for, we're not going to get too deep into atomics, that's sort of a longer discussion, but it means that this instruction where previously, okay, you know, if you want to say like, let count equal count plus one. 
this is two things. It's first a read, right, and then a write. And so in CPU instruction territory, you know, it's a load and then like an add and then like a, a store, okay? So it's going to take three clock cycles uh, and then, you know, two opportunities for this to get interrupted. Okay, uh, all an atomic is, is it does this entire thing in a single clock cycle. So like atomic uh, increment, we'll just call it or something. There's some fundamental atomics in pretty much every single modern CPU. Um, I don't know them off the top of my head, but the important thing is that this is now thread safe. And so this code works and okay, life is good. We are cloning the atomic reference counter, meaning we are, you know, saying, hey, you can look at this little mutex over here you know, as many people as you want. But of course, before anyone interacts with this mutex, it needs to lock it. And then it can increment the mutex, it'll unlock it because the thread ends, and uh, someone else can now attempt to uh, acquire that lock. Wonderful. Wonderful, wonderful. Okay, that's really the fundamentals of shared state. Um, you know, really, when you're approaching problems uh, that you need multiple threads working on them, you know, if you can't figure out a good way to use messaging, that's fine. Uh, you know, the, the next sort of idea is to use mutexes and just to analyze, okay, uh, who needs to access things what or when, um, you know, when, when, there, when a thread is accessing something, make sure it locks the mutex and then goes and does stuff with it and then unlocks the mutex, ideally as soon as possible, but of course, no sooner. Um, okay, and that's fundamentally the big idea here. So let's move on. Okay, so as I briefly mentioned, uh, lectures are no longer going to be Tuesdays and Thursdays. Um, they're going to release uh, whenever Anil and I uh, have time to record them. There's going to be three per week, and you only have to watch one of them. So we don't really care which one you watch. Uh, we're going to have, I think, probably four or so, maybe five consecutive lectures on each of these topics, just diving into, you know, random uh, sort of tidbits of information. Um, these probably will not be the same 25, 30 minute videos that you've been seeing. I probably think they'll range between 10 to 20 minutes, uh, but it just depends. Okay, and so like some examples for parallelism is I'm gonna talk about, okay, some of these uh, crates that people use in sort of practice, um, you know, rayon and thread pool and other things that, you know, if you're using parallelism in your final project, these are gonna be pretty useful to uh, be exposed to. I'll also talk about other things, just if you're interested in parallelism, one of these lectures is just gonna be dedicated towards, okay, who cares about Rust? Let's talk about parallelism at, at sort of a high level, right? Similarly, Neil is going to be talking about object-oriented programming and traits. We've discussed traits, you know, they, they show up all the time. I'm, I'm not sure how many times we've mentioned traits. I think we briefly mentioned them when we were doing sort of uh, impulse and instructs and whatnot. Uh, you're going to be diving more deeply into that, really analyzing how Rust deals with these things. And uh, this will really uncover, I think, a lot of the complexity of Rust and Okay, um, maybe the simplicity too, right? Fundamentally, traits are like everything that is missing uh, at this point. That, once you understand traits, you you pretty much understand it all, except for like maybe unsafe rust, but it's functional, basically the same. Okay, and then functional programming uh, we'll cover as well. Uh, this is uh, sort of a different paradigm, right? Way back when we mentioned that Rust was a multi-paradigm programming language. Um, functional programming is a, sort of a different way of approaching things that I think is uh, very, very popular, extremely powerful, and a really great tool to use. Um, so we'll we'll discuss this as well. Neil and I will split this up. We'll also have some uh, other lectures scattered along. Um, you know, I'll, I'll have some machine learning focused lecture. We like to do a how to get an internship lecture where we talk about, you know, just good practices and things like this. Uh, we might have some RSOs come in and do li little guest lectures uh, or, you know, companies or something. Uh, we'll see. Just, you know, we'll, we're keeping our options open. But... Uh, you know, once again, we expect you to follow one of these tracks, but you do not have to follow all three. If you feel like following multiple, that's fine. If you feel like hopping around, that's fine, but it might be not very easy to do because uh, sometimes they'll be sort of sequential and building on one another. Um, but okay, that's pretty much it. I hope you're excited for those. Okay, and then our final point of discussion today is the final project. So um, the final project is going to be uh, sort of released, for lack of a better term, uh, just after today's lesson. So your to-do list is as follows. Over spring break, uh, your goal is to find a group and come up with a project idea. Technically, you have a little bit after spring break. So this form is due on uh, March 24th, which is the Thursday after we return. Um, 
in this form, we'll, you'll list your net IDs, you'll list your group name. Uh, we encourage you to be creative with this. You know, th there's always fun, fun names that you can come up with. Uh, and then you'll also submit your GitHub. Um, the GitHub will look uh, something like this. So, okay, the GitHub will have uh, readme.md, which will have these different sections that we'll talk about in just a moment. Um, if you want to look at some examples, we have the uh, Fall 2021 Hall of Fame, which is our, our five favorite projects. Uh, and so, okay, take a, take a chance to look at these. I think that these are really cool, maybe a good uh, inspiration, potentially. But okay, this is going to be your sort of uh, reference for anything when it comes to the final project. So this is a document that we will be sharing uh, tonight as well, which has all of the information for the final projects that you need. So um, final projects will begin the Tuesday that you return. That final project proposal is due on Thursday. Uh, we will have two checkpoints during the final projects. We'll talk about those in a moment. And then they will be due on uh, uh, April, May, May 4th. Groups are two to three people. If you want to work solo or in a group of four, uh, you can ask us for permission and we'll approve it as long as you have a good reason why you need to work solo or in a group of four. We will probably not allow you to work in groups of five, uh, but okay, if you can figure out a way to work in a group of zero, then I guess I'll approve it. Um, we encourage you to use as many crates as you want. Uh, you know, we, we want these really to just be something that you're very proud of. So, uh, you know, uh, do cool stuff. Um, Okay, let's briefly discuss the GitHub. Uh, the first part is due 324, it's the readme. The readme should have all of this. So group name, group members, your net IDs, brief introduction of the project, uh, more technical description of the project, possible challenges that you see, uh, and then references. You know, if you're basing it off of something else, then uh, uh, discuss it here. Um, there's some uh, discussion that was happening early in the semester about doing you know projects that don't necessarily fit the mold of like a classic I'll say hackathon-esque standalone project, um, you know, contributing to open source software in Rust or doing X, Y, Z. That's totally fine. We really encourage you. And if you have some cool idea, just tell us uh, as long it's a high likelihood we'll approve it. Um, additionally, you know, your entire code base doesn't need to be in Rust. So I do a lot of, you know, computer vision and machine learning. Uh, I pretty much only exclusively do it in Python. Uh, and so, you know, if you want to deploy some model in Rust, uh, you know, but train it in Python, that's totally fine. Just make sure, you know, uh, at the end of the day, you know, we, we want to grade Rust code, not Python code. And so if 90% of your project is Python code and 10% is Rust, then okay, that, that's not ideal, right? And then eventually when you submit your final project, you'll also submit a run.md, which describes how to actually run the file. Uh, and of course, we'll be running your projects. Okay, uh, these checkpoints, uh, we the due dates are up here. You'll have an assigned sort of staff member. We just expect you to hop on a call before these dates at some point um, and, you know, talk about how progress is going. Uh, these will be graded, so uh, I'll go down to grading. Well, okay, we'll get to grading in a bit, but these will be graded, um, you know, just making sure that you've made some progress and also making sure that you're actually attending uh, is, is part of the grade for these. Okay, uh, in terms of submission, you will link us to GitHub and uh, you will have some sort of presentation, whether it be a video or an in-person presentation. We're, uh, okay, figuring out logistics for an in-person presentation, um, seeing if people are interested or not. On this same document, we have, you know, just a handful of random project ideas that we came up with. If you go to the Hall of Fame, here's five more really awesome project ideas, also linked right here. Here's five GitHubs that each probably have uh, a trillion project ideas. Um, I think this one had like an absurd amount. Maybe it was a different one. Okay, yeah, this just has a absolutely mind-blowing amount of projects. So, you know, um, there's inspiration, I guess. <laughs> if, you know, if you don't know what to do, uh, brainstorm some of these. Uh, one thing I really maybe encourage you is don't necessarily look at the actual content of the project, but more the idea, right? Do you want to work in parallelism? Do you want to do a lot of object-oriented stuff? Do you want to interact with graphics? Um, okay, we have a couple cool Rust crates here, but this uh, list is a little lacking. Maybe we'll beef it up pretty soon. And then once again, Hall of Fame exists. Uh, this is last semester's uh, top five, uh, which was super cool. Okay, let's discuss uh, grading. So uh, it's a total of 130%. So we have a lot of opportunity for extra credit here, uh, as well as some other opportunities for extra credit that I'll briefly mention. 15% um, of this is going to be your final project proposal, submitting it on time, making sure your readme is correct. 
uh, and your GitHub meets uh, specifications described right here. Um, each checkpoint will be 10%, 5% for participating, 5% for making progress. The code functionality will be 25%. So does it work? Uh, of course, you know, it's not a binary thing. If it works, but it's like a little buggy, we'll take a couple points off. If it doesn't work at all, but like we can fix it and then it would work, then uh, you know, it, you'll still get partial credit. We, we aren't going to grade these very harshly. Don't worry. Uh, we just want you all to make something that you're you know, really proud of. 25% for style. Um, you know, is your code clean? Is it is it pretty? Is it fun to read? There were some projects last semester that were like really... Uh, really amazing to read. I think like, okay, I can't remember which file it was, but not that one. That one was a little ugly. <laughs> but okay, like this one, for example, like implementing like really these fundamental uh, materials and, and things for um, uh, uh, a ray tracing engine was, was super cool. Okay, difficulty. Uh, if your project is hard, you know, did you utilize things that we taught you in class? Uh, you know, parallelism, object-oriented, impulse, things like this. Uh, what about stuff we didn't teach you, right? Um, there's there's a lot of stuff, functional programming, uh, special topics, you know, whatever. Um, you know, if it's hard, then it's, it's impressive, uh, for lack of a better term. Okay, uh, did you present? is another 10%. And then we'll also uh, release a peer evaluation um, at the very end, just making sure that you know you were a good teammate who uh, contributed. Okay, again, you get a lot of extra credit. Uh, in terms of plagiarism and, and copying, uh, you know, it, it's a little tough with these open-ended projects. Basically, just, just make sure that you're writing the majority of your code and that you know we say, make sure the project is your own. Um, feel free to use other people's GitHubs for reference, online guides, Stack Overflow answers, Rust crates, whatever. Um, you know, you can copy and paste snippets of code. Uh, it, it's totally fine for these final projects. Really, we want to see you, you know, make something really cool. Uh, but it's very important that you're the one writing the code at the end of the day, right? If you, you know, Google, you know, uh, Rust, multi-threaded, uh, we'll just say uh, web server, right? I mean, I can very easily get clone. Let me add GitHub. I can very easily get clone uh, this whole thing and like say this is my final project, but of course I didn't actually you know write any of this. Uh, and so, okay, can you clone this and then make a really cooler website off of this? Absolutely, right? Go for it. If you want to focus more on the website part and less on the multi-threaded you know logistic stuff, that's totally fine. But as long as you know the majority of the project is your own, you're good to go. If you have any questions, don't be afraid to reach out. Uh, just ask. We're we're happy to help. Um, and uh, that's pretty much it uh, for a final part for making it this far and for you know keeping up with lectures if you uh okay in the discord we now have a channel for uh, or we've had a channel for team building um you know post a message in there and if you ping me in your message i'll give you extra credit so congratulations on making it this far i hope that you've uh enjoyed the class thus far and i hope you continue to enjoy it i will see you around Bye bye